college and university before transitioning to Tallahassee Community College in Florida. Um, as a first generation student to college herself, she could relate to her, oh, sorry. Just a second, sorry about that, to the speaker. As a first generation student to, to, to college herself, she could relate to her students' hopes and dreams, their struggles and fears. So during her first semester teaching as an adjunct faculty member, she decided through education, she would make a positive difference in the lives of students and consequently the world. Dr. Willis worked as an assistant professor of history at Lone Star College and served as Dean of Academic Studies at Lee College, um, a Hispanic serving institution in Baytown, Texas. She earned a PhD in history from Florida State University with, with a focus on 19th and 20th century African, African American women's um, and the South. She earned a BA and MA in history from Florida University and played trombone in the college's incomparable Marching 100 band. Dr. Willis is a 2018 recipient of the American Association for Women in Community Colleges 40 Under 40 Award. She is, uh, she is a 2017 cohort fellow um, for the Thomas Lake Institution for Mentored Leadership, an organi organization dedicated to the training African American Community College Administrators for Presidency. So let's all give a warm welcome uh, to Dr. Daria J. Willis. Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you for this opportunity to give you an update on what's happening at Everett Community College. So I'm going to take a moment to get my presentation on board. So just give me a second here. Uh, share screen. Can you all see that presentation? No, not yet. May we can see the Zoom screen, but we haven't seen the presentation and it's not expanded yet. Hmm. Click I on that. Click on that one more time and I'll go to your desktop. It should. Yep. It's showing on my screen. Let's see. Let's do a new share. Ah, maybe that one. Maybe that works. How about that? There you are. Okay. Steve, I'll be I honest. I usually have an assistant or someone helping me do this kind of stuff. So <laughs> <laughs> forgive me. <laughs> all righty. Well, it's wonderful to uh, be with you all this afternoon. Um, and I, I'm celebrating a year at the helm of the institution. When I started, it was sunny blue skies and no one was thinking about COVID-19. And then all of a sudden in January, we started tracking uh, this mysterious illness that we were watching very closely uh, in China. And then as you know, most institutions had to shut our doors in March and move to remote operations. So. Um, but before I begin, you know, it's been a, a journey of love um, and just being able to watch our students, faculty, staff, and all of our employees join together to make sure that our students can truly be successful during such trying times. I want to give a shout out to my board of trustees uh, members and uh, my board chair, Dr. Brady Cobbs. We've been in literally constant contact and communication almost every day uh, since the uh, coronavirus pandemic began. So it's a pleasure to be here and I'll go ahead and begin. And if you have questions as I go through this presentation, uh, feel free to ask me at any time or you can also wait to the end, but it shouldn't take too, too much out of you all's meeting today. So first of all, congratulations on your 50 years of service to the community. Uh, you all have done a lot of good work uh, for people in those years. And I am so sorry to have missed the things that I've heard today, such as the blood drive and uh, the great Stilly Duck Dash. I hear that that's a great event. And I know that many of our ABCC students benefit from the scholarships that your clubs provide. 
I know that several of you attended our fundraising breakfast that uh, was virtual this year. So hopefully you made your own eggs and bacon and sausage and whatever you like to eat and clicked onto the Zoom link and supported us that way. But we sincerely want to thank you for all of your support. Uh, throughout this year, I have learned that this Rotary in particular has had three of your former presidents with specific ties to Everett Community College. John Garner was your president in, I believe, 83 to 84. Um, one of those years was my birth year. I'll let you guess which one, but I'm dating myself here. And uh, he was one of our former student athletes. Steve Robinson uh, led our criminal justice program for a few years. And I probably don't need to tell you how much of a supporter 1996 and 97 President Gene Chase is, was and still is to the club. We're proud to share these and I am sure many other connections over the years as we continue to work together. But I want to just emphasize that without great community support from members such as yourself, the college would not be in the state that we are today. So on to our pandemic response, because that's what I've been, I feel like I'm on tour uh, the last few weeks, you know, letting everyone know the good work that the college has done. Um, and again, like I said earlier, it has truly been a labor of love. So first of all, uh, around March, early March, we decided to extend our spring break to give us a bit more time to try to figure out uh, the mechanisms that we've used to move our courses to a, a remote environment uh, instead of a purely face-to-face -face, uh, uh, modality. Our student services are also uh, happening remotely and we are looking at daily decisions that will keep our campus safe and secure. Um, my number one priority is safety. Um, my number one priority is making sure that folks remain healthy in this environment. So I have been extremely reluctant to reopen the campus um, full scale as we've seen uh, happen across the country. Um, I don't want uh, Everett Community College to be responsible for anyone getting sick um, or you know, passing away due to COVID-19. So we have really deployed a lot of resources to make sure that our faculty and staff have the resources that they need and Wi-Fi capabilities and an internet access and electronic devices and also our students. You know, our student government association, they've done a really fantastic job at supporting the college. Out of their student fees, they gave the college $175,000 so that we could take that money and purchase 700 laptops and disperse those to students that were in need. Now we knew that before this uh, pandemic took place, that we had students that didn't have laptops or internet service or any food to eat or a place to live. Um, so that's why we had certain relationships with community uh, organizations. And we also uh, had our, um, uh, excuse me, uh, I'm having a brain fart, forgive me for that. <laughs> but we had our computer labs on campus for those students. Uh, but when the pandemic hit, we had to close those computer labs and disperse all the laptops that we had on the, uh, in the college possession and purchase more. Uh, so we were successful at doing that and we were very proud that our students stepped up to help the college uh, with those decisions. Um, we've also worked very hard in reopening some programs. So although we have about 95% of our course offerings are offered in a remote modality. We do know that we still need nurses out there to help us uh, combat this, this disease. So our nursing program was one of the first in the state to get a, a approval from the nursing commission to continue to offer some of our courses face-to-face -face and also in a simulated format. Um, and we also have our prop tech programs that are moving uh, in face-to-face -face modality as well, but those are using strict social distancing guidelines. So they are six feet apart within the classes. All students and staff have to wear their, P, uh, their PPE gear. Everyone has to come when they, before they come into the building, they get temperature checks. And every employee on campus has to get permission to actually come onto the campus. And when they do come, we all have to fill out, and I'm saying we, including myself, we have to fill out a COVID-19 response form to basically say that we have not experienced any of the, um, of the symptoms related to COVID or have been in close contact with anyone. Uh, so we have worked very hard and diligently to make sure that we maintain a safe environment at the college. 
So we are operating in phase two. We had a, uh, we were part of an article with the Herald Business Journal back in June to talk about the scope of some of our classes. And as you can see here, students that have their mask on and still working in class and, you know, uh, respecting the six feet of social distancing. We are working very closely with the Snohomish Health District and just recently um, as of this week, I am starting to create a task force of individuals that will get trained in contact tracing. One of the things that we learned early on in the pandemic was the Snohomish Health District and every other health district in the state became really overwhelmed by the number of people that were testing positive and it was became increasingly difficult to get information quickly so that we could act um, and not have to wait for any guidance. So now we are going to have folks that will be prepared to help us with contact tracing at the college that will be employees, not to supersede the Snohomish Health District, but to definitely work in partnership with them so that we can um, operate the campus smoothly and respond quickly um, as we move into flu season and the winter quarter. One of the other things that I am absolutely proud of is while we are, we're working on the pandemic, uh, unfortunately, uh, as, a, as many of you have seen, the death of George Floyd has really plagued the nation and is still something that is in our conscience as we move from day to day. Um, we have an equity and social justice division that has been very prominent in what we do as a college and with our five dimensions of equity and making sure that we practice what we preach as an institution and that we move forward and make sure that all students have equal access and opportunity to a higher education. And we know that our students, that while they are dealing with the pandemic, there's a pandemic of racial tensions and issues that this country has had to deal with for a long, long time. Um, but I'm proud that our, our college was front and center at the June um, peaceful protest that took place in downtown Everett. I was happy to be asked to be one of the speakers at that event. And we are uh, kicking into campus conversations and different levels of action that will certainly continue as we progress through the year. Uh, one of the things that I am challenging myself and other members of the college is that this issue is not just a moment, but we have to continue and keep up the momentum and keep the dialogue going so that we can truly end systemic racism in our society. Um, the woman pictured here is one of our employees, Aja Fame, with her three boys. And she, this is a picture of attendance at the June um, peaceful protest that took place in Everett. Um, and she made the front page of the newspaper. And, you know, this is a very raw emotional photo of how she felt and how her boys must feel and how I feel as a woman of color and our children. So this is something that we take, we do not take for granted. We don't take it lightly. Um, the week that it happened, uh, we made sure that we blocked out our Facebook, I mean, not our Facebook page, but our college website with the Black Lives Matter uh, photo and our statement on who we are as an institution. We're also working to see if we can send students to the March on Washington. Um, but what we need is your continued advocacy and leadership. Um, the, the things that we are doing to continue to talk about these issues and to realize that they are very real for our student population, but we need uh, the entire community to support us in this effort. Now, EVCC is proud to have welcomed three new vice presidents to our team. Uh, to give you a little bit of background and history, um, prior to the arrival of these three individuals, we had one person uh, with the title of executive vice president, and that person was responsible for managing both academic affairs, so all of the faculty, all of the classes, all of the students, and then student services and the employees that work on financial aid, for example. Um, in our social justice division, another example, and some other, some other divisions and areas. Um, but that became just too much for one individual to have to work on. So I decided early on last year that we would separate that position in two and have one vice president over academic affairs and another vice president over student services. So I'm proud to welcome Dr. Kathy Leaker. Uh, she has come to us from Kingsborough Community College in uh, New York. 
uh, from the City University of New York system, and Dr. Robert Hill. He is our Vice President for Student Services. He comes to us from Glendale Community College in California. The two of them started on January, uh, not January, but July 1st, and they've been doing an absolutely fantastic job trying to learn the college from a distance, because of course we are, uh, we've closed our physical doors, but building relationships that we, that are critical and the trust is critical to make sure that the college is looking towards the future. And then uh, we also have Dr. Phyllis Esposito. She has joined us recently on August 1st as our new Associate Vice President for Diversity, Equity, and Inclusion. And one thing that I want to mention here is that although she holds the title, it is not purely her responsibility to make sure that we are a college that is all about social justice, social justice advocacy, and anything else that comes with that. This is a college responsibility. So I am building my team um, as a new president at this institution, and we are well on our way to continue to serve the community. But one of the key things that we are looking at in this COVID environment is, you know, to be frank, you don't want to waste a good crisis. Um, we are really starting to look at the future of higher education and what does that mean um, for Everett Community College, for the state of Washington, and for the country. So we're going to work on embarking on our new strategic plan that will seek to answer this question, what is the future of higher ed? What is the future of education and work in the post-COVID world? I think everybody in this room, uh, in this virtual room, we were all at least getting up in the morning, five or six o'clock, eating our breakfast, getting in the car. Some of us may have been driving down to Seattle and having to work in a, in a cubicle or in an office or wherever from eight to five every day. But now life has transitioned to where we are operating and doing things from home or we are doing things from a virtual office that we never thought was possible. And so how do you continue in this environment if needed and, can, and to increase your community engagement? The other piece is we have to look at more online programming for EVCC. Right now we have one, only one um, uh, online degree program and we know that we need to work on expansion of that. Because in the post covert world, students are going to become a bit more tech savvy. I have uh, three children, my oldest is 16 and my youngest is two years old. My youngest daughter, she can pick up a cell phone, an iPad, a computer, and she can work it with no problems. So what is higher education going to look like for this two year old once she turns 18 and enters the college world? Will we still be writing on chalkboards or whiteboards or just lecturing, what will that look like and how will we move with the times and get ahead of the times? So we are very excited about this conversation that we're going to embark upon at the college and we are using the pandemic to help us to really think strategically about what will happen next. So with that, I will close my presentation. I will stop sharing my screen and I will entertain any questions that you all have. So Dr. Willis, the, there seems to be a trend away from calling them community colleges to going to just colleges. Uh, is that something that Everett's looking at as well or? No, sir, we are not. Um, I think one of our peer institutions recently uh, took community out of their name, um, but I love the term community. It is our middle name and it speaks to who we are and our mission as a college because we are supposed to be here to help our community. So as long as I am here, we will be Everett Community College. We won't be Everett College or Everett University. Uh, I have no interest in that. So um, at this time, we will stay uh, Everett Community College because that's who we are. With the online learning, is there, uh, are the teachers still teaching live and then everybody kind of logs in or is it going to be like a, a recorded format um, where students log in anytime they want and just kind of view the recorded um, lecture? That's a great question, Eric, and that's uh, really based on the instructor. Uh, some of our classes are asynchronous while others are in the synchronous modality, so some students do exactly what you say you know i'm teaching a class right now where i post the materials and i meet with the students virtually once a week others may have their classes where 
um, the students have to meet them at a certain particular time of the day. But the one thing that we have asked our faculty is to remain flexible because just like uh, how I'm home with my three kids and luckily they're not running through here and screaming and yelling while I'm on the screen because dad has them probably locked in a closet somewhere. Okay. Your, our students are the same exact way. And so they have to juggle work, life and everything else while attending school. So it's, 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 a, it's a flexible option. It just depends on the instructor, but yes, our courses will be offered asynchronously or in a synchronous format. So with the asynchronous option, because um, I'm thinking back to when I went to college and sitting through lectures, I mean, there was always the opportunity for students to raise their hand if they didn't understand something the teacher was um, explaining, and then the teacher could backtrack, you know, explain it in a different way. How does that work with asynchronous uh, teaching, where, you know, students may not have the opportunity to, to raise their hand and ask a question about the lecture? So students can also always have the opportunity to contact their instructor. Um, they can email them. A lot of instructors do Zoom meetings or office hours. Uh, and I say that the same if it was a face-to-face -face class because you have some students who are really um, a little nervous about saying their question out loud in front of everyone else. So they may wait until the end of class and contact the instructor and meet them in their office. And this is the same type of format here. So they have a variety of different opportunities to uh, contact their instructor for the resources that they need. Oh, okay. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Doctor, um, my name is Bob Campbell. And I, I'd first of all, like you to uh, tell John Olson, thank you for helping arrange this program. Um, he did some great work to getting this put together. Um, second of all, I'd, I'd like you to share with what's going on with enrollment. Have people shied away from um, enrolling because of the uncertainty or are you seeing an in increasing because of the flexibility? Third, what's going on with nursing and is there a transitional program from a um, AD degree to a BS degree that you are helping sponsor or work with to make more baccalaureate nurses uh, transition from the AD nurses? So the first was thanking John Olson. I'll make sure that I check that off and do that today. Uh, the second is enrollment. That's a great uh, question. So this summer we are up in our enrollment numbers. I think after it's all said and done, we'll end about 2.4% up from where we were last year, which is a really good thing. Um, and I'll just backtrack a little bit. Pre-COVID, we were rocking it with enrollment. We were doing very well. Um, I was excited and then all of a sudden COVID happened and we took a hard dip uh, in March. And we did a lot of work to try to build that back up, but we ended our spring quarter with about 0.5% down, which is a really um, good showing and support from our, our staff and employees. For fall, we started our enrollment about four weeks later than we typically would do because we were still trying to answer questions on what's going to happen next. And that was the early days of the pandemic where it was so much information coming out. Um, so we started around 19% down, and as of this week, we're about 8% down. So we are trending up each week. So I'm hoping that we will level off for the fall. I'm praying that we will level off um, because we are seeing some reductions in our state appropriation, and we really don't want to have to deal with an enrollment issue along with a reduction from the state. As far as nursing is concerned, we have uh, several um, articulation agreements with um, our four-year partners to offer that BS, uh, the baccalaureate for our nursing program. So uh, our nursing students have every opportunity to continue their studies as soon as they finish or whenever they go out into the field, they wanna come back and get the four-year, they can absolutely do that through the articulation agreements we have with our partner universities. Good, thank you. I have a question with the um, now that you're dealing with a lot more online in the future when things get more whatever you call back to normal are you gonna what adaptations are you guys thinking about doing now that you can do online then and in person in the future I don't know if that makes any sense are you guys learning any strengths or any th opportunities from this Absolutely. I appreciate that question. So I'll give you one quick example. Um, I have the series called The Trojan Talk. Um, it's my campus forum where I address all of the college about whatever's going on. The sky is blue today. I need to tell the college that. 
So uh, when we first had um, our Trojan talk back in, I think the first one was September, October of last year, we had about 150 people show up. Um, and that's how we were trending. But as soon as the pandemic hit, I had to turn those into an online format. And then I think the last one we had, we had about 360 participants. So the same things that folks are recognizing in these various Zoom meetings that in my opinion are getting old, but I get it. One of the great things about Zoom is that you don't have to drive to go to a meeting. It's just simply clicking onto the device and logging in. And there's still a lot of different interactions that take place. I think the other piece is um, realizing that yes, we can do this online thing. Uh, we had a variety of online classes that were offered at the institution, but now we're looking at how do we package those into programs so that we can reach not only the dual credit students from the high schools, but the adult student population that maybe can't afford to come back to class face to face. Um, we're also looking at providing hybrid options for our students, but all of this came through because of the pandemic. And I'll, I'll say one more thing about that. You know, if it were, let's say two years ago or six months ago, and you asked the science faculty, can we offer this science lab uh, online? They would have tore me up and spit me out, right? Mm -hmm. And said, no, we can't do that because pedagogically you can't learn online. But you know what? They all have the lab kits now and they're doing an excellent job teaching those classes online. It may not be the preferred way, but it is a way um, and they are working hard to make it work and meet students. So I think a lot of what we are doing, I do wanna see us hold on to, and that's gonna be part of our strategic planning discussion that we'll have as an institution and in the community about what's next for the college. What can we hold on to and how can we move forward in the future? I have a question about the future. Can you hear me? Yes. Okay. I'm Sarah Arney. I'm a former reporter and a president of Arlington Arts Council. The last couple years, we, I attended meetings about the future of the old high school building. And I believe some people were there from Everett Community College about possibly using it as a branch campus. And this is, of course, long-term future stuff, not knowing when we get, if and when we get back to normal. But I just thought I'd like to plant the idea that that building needs to be saved and how can we help make it happen as a branch campus and have it also revitalized as a community center that serves the community. <laughs> I don't know if it's a question or just a comment. Future planning. What high, what high school campus are you referring to? The old high school in Arlington is a 1936 structure that is uh, quite retro and it needs retrofitting and it, it would be a project, but it could be an excellent branch campus. Thank I you believe. for that. Okay, <laughs> I really appreciate it. Sarah. Thank you okay, so much. Thank you. Thanks for being here. Sarah? Yes? Um, do you know, um, has the school board made any decision on what they're gonna do with that building or are they just sort of wandering? Well, the last thing I heard was we did a call for proposals and there was no application at all. And they had a real estate agent trying to recruit proposals and there were none. So I haven't heard anything since then. Okay. Daria, I, this is Gene Chase again. And I, I have a question for you, Daria. On building, well, since we're talking buildings, do you guys have anything in the queue right now for the next year on building with the state that the legislature maybe could whack at? What do you mean whack at? Um, what's that phrase? Well, <laughs> what I'm I want to make sure I answer your question. Right, right? <laughs> I just want to make sure I answer your question. Well, I, you know, the, the way they usually have that rating of one to 100, and if you're in the top 20. Yeah, the you list get, you mean? Uh -huh. Yeah, the list. Okay. Yeah, and yeah, yeah. You got anything in there that could get whacked, cut off this year? Oh, cut off, taken away. Okay, I got you. Um, we have two projects. Uh, one is our Learning Resource Center that will go on the east side of Broadway, right where WSU Everett is. And then the next one is Baker Hall. As of right now, um, nothing has been whacked from the list. We are still high up, and um, our Learning Resource Center 
should break ground within the next couple of years. Um, and that's our new library. It'll be state of the art. We'll have a children's area in it. And I'm just really excited to see that project go forward. And then we'll have to redo Baker Hall, um, which is an, a very older structure that's still on campus. It'll also be moved to the east side of Broadway. Um, so hopefully, fingers crossed, nothing is going to get cut just as of yet from capital. Um, but I'm glad you brought that up. You know, if you see your legislators or, you know, folks that you know from Olympia, let them know the importance of community colleges. Uh, because just like what we saw in the 2008 and 10 recession, it'll be the community colleges that help retool America's workforce and get people back to work. And so we need them to understand and know that. Thank you. Hey, doctor, I have a, a question for you. Mm -hmm. um, so there's a lot of focus, obviously, going into fall with colleges and universities going back to campus. Uh, nationally, we're seeing the larger conferences in terms of athletics, uh, discussing what they're going to do. A lot of people don't realize that every community college has, I think, 10 or 11 sports. Um, can you touch on just how that's going to impact uh, you as we move forward? Yes, so we are uh, under the Northwest Athletic Conference, and that is an interesting and touchy subject at this point. Um, I approved cross country to um, go back into play status starting in September, because when my thought, my, my preliminary non-athletic brain said, well, in cross country, you're running away from each other. So it's not like we're going to be touching and bouncing a ball and uh, the same as the same things you see in volleyball or basketball. Um, so that's our test case for the campus right now is to see what happens with um, cross country. We are meeting as a region with other regional presidents to figure out um, and try to make decisions based on the region and not an individual college. As of right now, um, I have made no decisions about any other sports um, just because of the obvious concerns with COVID-19 and then also eligibility for the students. Uh, so when they go on to four year, they need to play uh, at the two year level so that they can get those transfer opportunities. Um, but those are still up in the air. The NWAC commission, however, has a very detailed guideline for back to sports play. And um, a lot of those sports are going to most likely be delayed, uh, a delayed start possibly next year in the spring. So we're just watching and waiting. But as of right now, the only sport that we've approved for fall and winter quarter will be cross country. Thank you. Are there any students that are electing to continue in your uh, student housing rather than going home and are they are they doing their distancing from a dorm room or so we saw a significant thank you for that question dave um, we saw a significant drop in student housing for two reasons one because obviously if we're going to move online students say well i can do online at home uh, and then the second was our international students. Uh, a lot of them elected to go home as well. And then you've probably seen some of the news headlines about the current uh, administration saying that international students, if they're taking classes all online, could not be in the country. So it just didn't put us as far in a good light with uh, students. So as of right now, um, in our housing, we are about at 50% capacity. So there still are some students that are staying in our residence halls. Uh, we'll see what happens uh, throughout the fall quarter. But housing is a tricky one, uh, especially during a pandemic. I don't necessarily want the housing to be at 100% capacity because if someone gets ill, then I've got to figure out how to quarantine those students and make sure that the others who are not ill remain safe. So while there is a uh, financial uh, implication to that decision, at the end of the day, it's all about preservation of life and making sure that folks are healthy. So we're at 50% capacity. I suspect it will stay that way um, throughout this next academic year. Any other questions for Dr. Willis? A question. 
Um, I'm sorry, I don't know if you touched on this subject yet or not, but I was wondering if everything is going to be primarily online learning, um, what, what does that mean for tuition costs? So tuition, and thank you for that question, Mel, tuition is set by the state. And the State Board for Community and Technical Colleges has authorized a 2.5% increase to tuition. So tuition um, will have, the tuition rates will change for this academic year, but that is not something that Everett Community College can, uh, can change. That, that is run by the State Board. I have a question. Have you seen um, many cases on campus? No, I wish I had some wood to knock on, knock on wood. Uh, we had one, and don't quote me here, I think we had one confirmed case with the student um, early on, and that was right after we made the decision to close the college. So I closed before we had a confirmed case. And then we had an employee who um, tested positive um, but that employee had not been on campus for several weeks and it was um, that that person's close contact was with a family member. Uh, then recently there was a volunteer um, within the last month or so that was on campus in the evening hours uh, performing some custodial work that had tested positive. So that makes three, um, but again, there was no um, issue of contact because they had not come into contact with anyone late in yeah. the evening when we were working. No, that's encouraging. Thank you. Mm -hmm. So we want to make sure we don't have any more, but the, the more you open, the likelihood that it'll happen and we have the protocols in place to um, figure out what to do if the cases come up again. That's why yes. we're working on the um, contact tracing to make sure we're equipped with that this year. Are there any other questions for me? I've enjoyed this time with you all. Uh, I am late for another meeting, but I am happy to answer one or two more. Uh, but if not, thank you so much for this time. And I promise uh, it won't be the last time that I address this group. And I appreciate your support of Everett Community College and our students. Dario, I just want to say something as you're going out the door, an old trustee. I really appreciated what you said about keeping the name community in there, not University of Everett or blah, 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 some of these egomaniacs want to do. So I appreciate what you're doing. Thank you. Yep, we're Everett Community College. We are the community's college. That's not changing. Thank you for that. All right. Uh, thank you so much, uh, Dr. Willis. And with that, uh, meeting adjourned. Thank you.